It's the purpose of this video to simplify many of the complex problems which occur in the MIG welding industry today. Today's welder has got many variables that have to be adjusted and balanced. For example, is he using the correct size wire and the right type of wire? Should he be possibly using a flux cord or should it be a MIG wire? And then what about the voltage and the amperage, the wire fee speed? This has to be balanced very carefully to get a spatter-free weld. What about the gas and then technique? These are all questions, questions which require answers. And it's the purpose of this video film to provide simple, no-nonsense, straightforward solutions to these problems. You know, selecting a power source today is a little different from what it was 10 years ago. The range of size of power sources has changed dramatically as we've gone, in particularly in North America, uh, to thinner materials. The amperage output requirements is much less now than what it was 10 years ago. Let's look at some of the features that you might want to consider when you're selecting a power source. Some of the units on the market offer the uh, two slope outputs, a steep slope and a flat slope. What, what, what does slope mean exactly? Well, in this particular machine, the steep slope provides uh, control during the short circuit. It doesn't allow the current to be too high each time the wire short circuits. So if you're welding thin metals, having a steep slope output provides a little bit better control. And then when you go to spray transfer, you might possibly want to weld 3 16 half an inch steel. Then you would have the flat slope output. The flat slope output actually allows more current if a wire does short circuit so that the power source can respond more quickly to the changes during a weld. Now, a lot of machines basically may not have these two outlets on here, but they will have uh, an output which is somewhere in between the steep and the flat. Again, uh, some machines have the inductance. What is inductance? Inductance is beneficial, again, in short circuit applications. It kind of uh, slows the current down each time a short circuit takes place so we don't have this instantaneous response and surge and explosion. In other words, it's really beneficial for cutting down on spatter and because the arc is on time a little bit longer, the short circuit wells may be a little bit more fluid and therefore look a little bit better. When you look at a power source today, you can simply look to see that the power cable is attached to the positive side and that that power lead should in actual fact find a connection up on the wire feeder. It's usually connected to the torch block. The easy way is simply just to check that the ground cable is attached to the negative side. I've always remembered it, the, the old simple method that uh, reverse electrode positive stands for the Republican Party, REP, reverse electrode positive. Applications. If welding up to 3 16 of an inch, a 150 to 200 amp single phase power source is sufficient. 035 wire is the most practical choice. A 250 to 300 amp power source is practical on metals up to one half inch. This is typically a three phase power source. This is ideal for 035 MIG wires 
and 045 flux cord wires. A practical power source for today's fabricator is a 400 to 450 amp three-phase unit, which has a wide range of applications. Ideal for 035 to 045 MIG wires and 045 to 116 flux cord wires. You know, stops and starts in MIG welding are responsible for about 90% of all the defects that occur. And the greatest influence on stops and starts is how you select your wire feeder. Let's look at some of the main features that should be given consideration in selecting a good wire feed system for MIG welding. Consider the following features when selecting a wire feeder. The drive motor is the heart of the unit. A permanent magnet motor runs much cooler than a shunt motor. A permanent magnet motor also responds much faster for improved stops and starts. Gas coverage is critical at the weld stops and starts. A practical wire feeder feature would be a pre and post gas flow control to ensure gas coverage. Also a gas purge switch to eliminate air from the gun. Burn back control eliminates the need to keep trimming the wire for the correct stick out length. Correct stick out ensures minimum spatter at the weld starts. For consistent amperage, a digital wire feed speed readout enables the operator to obtain consistent results. An important safety feature is a cold feed control, which feeds wire through the torch without connecting the current. You know, selecting a MIG gun can be critical if you're a high production shop. There is so much time lost today in production welding because of the, well, the wrong type of nozzle. Maybe somebody should have ordered a heavy duty nozzle. And what about the contact tip? Is it a short one? Is it a long one? Does it suit the specific application? And of course, the gun itself. Is it designed for the duty cycle in which you weld? Can it take the spray transfer is it designed for it? There are many factors which should be given consideration in selecting a gun. MIG gun selection. With power supplies using less than 200 amps, use a 200 amp gun. With argon mixes using up to 300 amps with less than 60% argon time, use an air-cooled 400 amp gun. With argon mixes using up to 400 amps, with low argon times, use a 600 amp air-cooled gun. When welding with argon mixes above 200 amps at an argon time over 60%, a water-cooled gun is recommended. When using argon mixes above 200 amps at an argon time over 50%, to extend the nozzle life, use a heavy-duty gas nozzle. We've talked a lot so far about short-circuiting and spray art. What is exactly short-circuit and spray transfer? These are two different modes of transfer which really make MIG welding unique. As a matter of fact, no other welding process provides two distinctly different forms of weld metal transfer. Now with the short circuiting considered a, a low amperage 
mode of transfer in which the wire short circuits generally uh, up to about 120 times per second. Then we have the high amperage spray type uh, transfer in which the wire doesn't short circuit and it's generally over 200 amps. Deep penetration, high deposition. So you see we have one mode of transfer short circuiting, ideal for sheet metal applications, and then we have the other mode, spray transfer, ideal for thicker plate, generally over one eight for three millimeter plate. When we understand how to set the parameters for these two important modes of transfer, then we truly understand the MIG process. You know, with MIG welding, it's really the amps that uh, melt the wire. And we have to get amps out of the power source. Now, the voltage will push the amps out, but the bottom line is we have to have a conductor, something for the amps to travel along. Now, if we have no wire coming out of the gun, then we can't draw amps out of the power source. The faster that the wire is fed through the torch, then the more amperage or current it can draw from the power source. Now, you've got to remember that the current actually is fed into the wire just about a quarter of an inch from the end of the contact tip. So it hasn't got far to travel. The relationship between the voltage and the wire feed speed is critical for attaining uh, optimum quality wells. Understanding the relationship between the wire feed and the amperage for a given diameter wire is also uh, critical if you uh, want to achieve maximum deposition in your wells. Let's look at a traditional wire feeder and which by the way most wire feeders run in a range of 650 to 750 IPM on average around 700 IPM or 300 millimeters per second. The incremental control on a wire feeder may state 0 to 100 or 0 to 10 but traditionally, it's in increments of 10, which means each control on the wire feeder is approximately 70 inches a minute or 30 millimeters per second. Let's look at the relationship again of the wire feed to the amperage to the short circuit requirements as it relates now to an 035 electrode. First of all, we can see that if a wire feed control, if we look at it simply as we would look at a clock, we have from the 12 o'clock position, the 1 o'clock position, we can see that the short circuit range traditionally goes between the 7 o'clock position and the 1 o'clock position on a normal wire feeder, which means it's running around 50 IPM to about 420 IPM. The green uh, marks on the wire feed control here are millimeters per second. And we have, as you can see, 70, 140, 210, 280, 350, 420 IPM. It's inside this wire feed range of 70, 420 IPM that we draw in current around 50, 60 amps to around 200 amps. This amperage range is the range for short circuit welding. So on a simple sketch like this, we can now determine a lot of data for short circuit welding. We can determine the current range, 60 to 200 amps, is traditionally found at the 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock position on a normal wire feeder. If you have a digital wire feeder, then it would be between 70 inches a minute and 420 IPM. We can also see that on this simple chart, the voltage requirements for short circuit welding, 14 volts, 
to 21 volts. A simple setting is as you turn each incremental control one turn, we go up one volt. The 9 o'clock position is 16 volts. The 10 o'clock position is 17 volts. The 11 o'clock position is 18 volts. And what about the thickness that we work with with short circuit welding? What about the gauge thickness? Well, the gauge range is around 23 gauge to 10 gauge. The most common gauge that's welded is 16 gauge, which is found at the 10 o'clock position. As you can see, the 10 o'clock position around 140 amps, 17 volts on 16 gauge. In conclusion, on this small parameter chart, we could simply look at short circuit welding as being a process that welds less than an eighth of an inch. And if you had to weld sheet metal less than 16, you could see that you would set below the 10 o'clock position approximately start off at the 9 o'clock position at 16 volts. If you had to weld material over 1 16th, then you would traditionally start at the 11 o'clock position, 18 volts. You know, so far we've talked about the basic requirements for short circuiting, voltage in around 17, 18, wire feed around 11, 10, 11 o'clock position, or you could even start it off in the middle as long as you're in the range. Let's look at some real applications uh, with one objective in mind. We don't want spatter, and we want to do all these applications on one simple setting. Applications like, well, 10 gauge plate, vertical up. Applications like 60 foul material, fillet weld. How about a root pass in a pipe? These are basically short circuiting applications. Remember, the simple rule is if it's less than an eighth of an inch or it requires vertical up or vertical down or you're welding a gap, you simply think of short circuiting welding. We go over to the machine with the voltage. We adjust the voltage to strike an arc on a plate and watch the meter so we've got 17, 18 volts. With the wire feed, we simply set the wire feed in around the 10 or 11 o'clock position. Now let's look at the 116th application. Again, we will use the same parameters with the objective of a complete spatter, well, a spatter-free weld. As we examine this 116 plate, we look at the weld. We can see again, absolutely there isn't one piece of spatter on the plate. And it's really not so much welding technique as it is simply setting those parameters where they should be. It doesn't matter whether you're welding a pipe or a piece of sheet metal, you're going to use short circuit welding. 
and in short circuit welding, particularly on quality work, on cold work and on very thin sheet metals, wire stick out becomes critical. Notice on this pipe application that the wire stick out is approximately 3 sixteenths of an inch. By keeping the wire stick out small like this, I can use the minimum amount of voltage, which on an application like this is usually around 17 or 18 volts. If your wire stick out, like many operators, is going to be a half an inch long due to the fact that your contact tip is now down inside the nozzle. See, we have a, a half to five eighths of an inch. You will need, at this particular setting, an extra volt or two. And having those extra one or two volts every time the wire short circuits, again, the arc becomes a little less stable. So the critical thing is, on short circuit welding, contact tip about an eighth of an inch outside the nozzle, and the wire stick out about three sixteenths of an inch from the end of the contact tip. Short circuit wire selection. When welding continuously on sheet metal less than 045, use 030 wire. When welding on sheet metals more than 045, use an 035 wire. If using straight CO2 gas, use a high silicon wire, such as an E70S-6. When welding coated or galvanized steels, Avoid the E70S6 wires. High silicon wires promote cracking. Use E70S-3. When you select a welding gas, there are, for short circuit welding, there are, there are certain factors that need to be considered. If you're welding on very thin metals, less than, say, 60 foul, then it's wise to use an argon mix which doesn't have a lot of reactive gas in it. What does that mean? Well, the typical mix in the marketplace is 75 argon, 25 uh, CO2. But if you're going to weld on, on 25, 30 foul materials or weld along the edge of a sheet metal, then why not use argon with two, uh, we'll say 2% oxygen? Why does this benefit your application? Well, simply from a point of view that argon oxygen uses less voltage than argon CO2. For example, with argon CO2, you would require um, 17, 16, 17 volts to keep a stable arc. But when you get into argon oxygen, you can work at 13 and 14 volts. Again, where should you use argon oxygen? On sheet metal, where you want to weld along the edge of the sheet metal, on sheet metal, say less than uh, 40 foul, you will find it extremely beneficial to use 98 argon, 2% oxygen. When you're welding on an application such as this, where it's just over an eighth of an inch and you want to put a nice bead without spatter, you obviously need more heat. Using now uh, 75 or 80 argon and 20% CO2 is fine for an application like this. But if you constantly weld in a shop and where you're welding on sheet metals and you never go above 16th of an inch, then it's wise to use maybe eight to 10% CO2. After all, you know, when you're welding sheet metals, the object is not to burn through. And if we can reduce the heat just a little bit by reducing the reactive part of the gas mix, then it makes it a little easier.
short circuit gas selection. Characteristically, CO2 creates a digging effect, which reduces arc stability. Utilizing CO2, the arc is hotter, influencing burn through potential on thin metals. With CO2, the volt and amp range is very narrow, which makes it difficult for the welder to obtain optimum arc stability. Using CO2, the spatter level increases with an increase in current. CO2 promotes more surface oxides, which should be removed before painting. The material thickness, joint type, and weld position are the prime factors in considering an optimum gas mixture for short circuit welding. On metals less than 035, argon oxygen allows the use of lower voltages, which reduces burn through potential and minimizes damage to coatings on the opposite side of the material. Remember, the thinner the sheet metal, the less heat it requires from the welding gas. These mixtures provide the required level of arc energy with optimum arc stability. For increased arc energy, a slight increase in reactive gas improves penetration and weld fluidity. For root passes vertical down or filler passes vertical up on pipe less than 3 eighths of an inch thick, use argon 15 to 25 percent CO2. This provides penetration and arc stability. If the pipe is thicker than 3 eighths of an inch, CO2 is required for the filler pass to provide sufficient sidewall fusion. The most practical gas mix for a plant using bulk would be to set the mix at 15 to 20 percent CO2. As we increase the current above the short circuit range, we go into an open arc process, which we call spray transfer. Spray transfer uh, utilizes higher currents and higher voltages than short circuit welding. The current range is, is traditionally 170 to about 400 amps. The voltage range is 23 to about 37 volts. With spray transfer, we can achieve higher deposition rates. Uh, deposition rates in the range of uh, approximately 19, 20 pound an hour can be achieved with an 045 wire. With spray transfer, the penetration is excellent. The application range for spray transfer is one eighth to almost any thickness. Remember, when utilizing spray transfer, it's a hot process. The radiation is high. You need good protection for not only the hands, but for the neck and for the body. And ensure you use a correct lens for spray transfer. The selection of parameters for spray transfer is relatively simple. If you remember with the 035 wire where we finish the short circuit welding at the one o'clock position, around 200 amps. Well, to get spray and to get into that high deposition process, we have to be over 200 amps. As you can see, therefore, the spray range with an 035 wire is between the one o'clock position and between the three, four, five o'clock position. The current range will be traditionally 230 to about 350 amps. The voltage, 30 to 34. A voltage range of 30 to 34. An ideal starting point with an 035 wire on many applications, 1 8, 3 16, a quarter, would be to set the wire feed in the middle of its position, the 3 o'clock position, 560 to 600 IPM or 240 to 250 millimeters per second, you would have about 280 amps and 31 volts. That's an ideal simple starting setting. Now the problem with 035 wires is deposition. As we'll see later on, we're going to be working at relatively high currents 
but at about 50% less deposition than we'll be achieving with an 045 wire. The ideal wire, therefore, for spray transfer is an 045 wire. As you can see, the wire feed range now is extended from the 10 o'clock position to the uh, 5 o'clock position. The current, we need at least 220 amps, a lower voltage, 25, up to 34 volts. 045 is the most suitable wire, not only because it's a, a lower cost wire than the 035, but also because of this extended current range and the achieved deposition rates. In the current range of 220 to 450 amps, we can achieve almost up to about 19 pounds per hour. An ideal starting point with the 045 wire would be approximately the 2 o'clock position. You want to be somewhere between 400 and 500 inches a minute. Do you remember with the 035 wire, it was in the range of 5 to 600 inches a minute. The 045 wire in the range of 4 to 500 inches a minute, between the 1 and 2 o'clock position, is again an ideal starting point on quarter inch. If you need to go to 3-8 steel, then you would traditionally be again at the 3 o'clock position. Once you open up wide open with an 045, you start to get a turbulence effect on the weld puddle down at the higher end. Most of the welding with 045 is done between the 1 and 4 o'clock position on high deposition work. Can you remember where we set the contact tip for short circuit welding? Slightly outside the nozzle. Keep the wire stick out short. Spray transfer is the, uh, is the exact opposite. We should set the contact tip slightly inside the nozzle, maybe about an eighth of an inch down inside the nozzle. Two reasons for this. One, we need a longer stick out because we no longer short circuit. And the other reason is we want to protect the contact tip from the intense heat. The wire stick out should be half to five eighths of an inch in length. When you put the nozzle on, make sure the contact tip is slightly recessed. Remember, when using spray transfer, the selection of your MIG gun is critical. Use the information previously provided under MIG gun selection earlier in this tape. Improper selection will result in early torch failure and a high nozzle and contact tip failure rate, which will also influence arc stability. In this highly competitive industry, everybody tries to find a way to save a dollar. If you use spray transfer on 1 8 to any thickness in the flat and horizontal positions, then you can save some money by selecting an 045 wire in, instead of an 035 wire. You know, an 035 wire in spray transfer is, is fed at almost a, a feed rate of, 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 of 10 inches a second. Now, with an 045 wire, the feed rate would actually be in the range of uh, six inches to eight inches. The slower the feed rate through the system, the less feed problems in general. We can also achieve the same high depositions by just increasing the current. We get very good arc stability, a slightly wider voltage coverage off the larger wire, all the economical sense is there. It costs less, it's better to use. So consider 045 wire for your next spray application. In the fabricating industry, if we can achieve, well, 12 to 15 pounds an hour in terms of deposition rates, then we've truly got a handle on our cost. When we look at a well such as this 3.8 fillet weld, let's see what we can do with both an 035 and an 045 wire. 
as you can see with the 035 in the spray transfer range, the actual deposition rate achieved is typically between 5 and 10 pound an hour. As a matter of fact, you may wish to remember that every time you turn the wire feeder one increment with an 035 electrode, you are going up about one pound per hour. One pound per hour. Now let's have a look at the 045 wire. The spray range again, we can see the difference now for each incremental turn on the wire feeder, it's two pound, eight, 10, 12. An ideal starting point, as mentioned previously with an 045 wire, is at the two o'clock position, which is 14 pounds an hour. Already, you are 50% more than you will attain with an 035 wire. Traditionally, again, we do not go too high with an 045 because of the turbulence, but 14 to 15 pound an hour is readily attained with an 045. This is the reason the 045 wire should be utilized on all applications over 3 16 of an inch. In many cases of spatter and poor wells, it, well, it's quite often just a matter of a fine adjustment on the power source. Too high a voltage results in a quiet arc sound. The weld will be extremely fluid, producing an uncomfortable amount of heat for the welding operator. Smoke levels will rise as voltage increases. The results of too high an arc voltage are all too obvious. High volts will result in unacceptable undercut. 